brings us the third part, the series about the, uh, the Roman and the Byzantine emperors. I want to talk about Antoninus Pius, his successor Marcus Aurelius, his uh, co-emperor Lucius Verus, and the usurper Avidius Cassius. Uh, this speech is mainly, uh, it concerns mainly Marcus Aurelius, but it includes the other three minor emperors as well. Now, Antoninus Pius became emperor in 138, he succeeded Hadrian. And Antoninus Pius, first of all, he, um, when he became emperor, he learned that a group of people were condemned to be killed by Hadrian. And what happened was that Antoninus Pius ordered the Senate to, uh, to stop the execution. That's one of the reasons why he earned the cognomen of Pius. And then, not long after that, uh, the Senate, they, they wanted to uh, punish, let's say, Hadrian by not proclaiming him divine because he had executed four senators in the, in the earlier part of his reign. And that was quite unjust because these four senators, they tried to kill Hadrian and he only did it in self-defense. And Antoninus Pius begged the Senate to, uh, to deify Hadrian after his death. So for these two reasons, the, uh, the pardoning of these people who were condemned by Hadrian and the deification of Hadrian, he, he only cognomen Pius, Antoninus Pius, and he was the founder of the Antonine dynasty also. The, part of his will claimed, the main clause of his will claimed that when Hadrian died, Antoninus Pius would succeed him, but Antoninus Pius was obliged to adopt, in his turn, Marcus Aurelius, as the senior emperor and Lucius Verus as the minor emperor, his co-emperor. So, Antoninus Pius, uh, Pius' reign was considered to be a peaceful one. Well, in fact, there were several wars. There were actually seven campaigns during his 23-year reign. And we have a little knowledge about these uh, campaigns. Now, in 142, the Brigandes, a Celtic tribe somewhere in Britain, rebelled and they were defeated. See, so we, we don't really know who the commander was, who the, the, the proconsul, the legate was, who defeated them. We don't actually know about the battles that took place. We just know that he defeated them. And even the dates are quite vague, too. In 144, the Moors, the Numidian, the Berber tribes rebelled. They were defeated by a Roman for a consul, and they were forced to flee to the Atlas Mountains. In 145, the Germans rebelled, and they were again defeated. In 157, perhaps, the Dacians rebelled. Now, the Dacians, they were, they were recently conquered by Trajan, as we learned in a previous video. And they rebelled, and they were again defeated. So that's four campaigns we hardly know anything about. And sometime during his reign, the Egyptians rebelled, and they were defeated again by an anonymous legate or proconsul and the Alans rebelled actually they didn't rebel, they made a raid and they were repelled by the Roman forces again we don't know who beat them or how they did it the seventh and final campaign that took place in the reign of Antonius Pius was the force of Scythians they besieged the Greek colony Olbia and a Roman force was sent to relieve the colony and when the, the Roman troops arrived, the Scythians departed. The Scythian tribes, uh, and there was hardly any fighting. Or if there was, there were, it, it was restricted to a few skirmishes. So that's about it, as far as battles were, were, were concerned. Um, it was a relatively peaceful reign, but there were at least seven campaigns. Now, at, well, not everything was actually uh, was, was was rosy in his campaign. We see that uh, in his rule. We see that Attilius Titianus and a certain Priscus that they planned to overthrow and murder Antoninus Pius. Uh, Antoninus Pius was tipped off 
the conspirators were arrested and executed. We don't know when it happened, actually. And finally, we learn from the historian Gusta that Avigas Cassius also planned to overthrow Antinus Pius, but for some reason he was not prosecuted. Now, Avigas Cassius would, soon, would become a usurper in the year 175. He would rebel against his best friend Marcus Aurelius. He was a half Greek, half Jewish aristocrat who grew up the scale. He was one of the finest commanders in his, of his time. So we see that even then, he was trying to tip the balances and become an emperor. Uh, Antinus Pius died in 161 AD after a 23 year reign. Now, the ironic thing about Antoninus Pius was that he has no history. Someone's, uh, some historian quoted, and I quote back, that Antoninus Pius has no history because he was so good. Nothing wrong uh, actually happened in his, in his, uh, during his rule. He did nothing wrong. He killed no one. He did nothing worthy of uh, talking about. So that's why the sources we have about him are so limited and few. So he killed no one, he didn't kill his relatives, he didn't actually uh, debauch anyone. And he died in 161 after a 23 year reign, and he's considered one of the finest emperors of Rome. He built wonderful edifices and there were many philosophers flourishing during his reign. Now, we go on to Marcus Aurelius. Now, in 161 AD, Marcus Aurelius becomes, uh, succeeds Antoninus Pius, along with Lucius Verus, as his co-emperor. In 161 AD, Marcus and Lucius, they are appointed consuls. Now, why they were appointed consuls, that we, we, we must remember that these are not real consuls. I mean, they were not, these people were not elected. The Senate did not approve them. Everything was prearranged by Marcus himself, by Lucius Verus, and a few of his senators, his, his high ranking senators. Now, they were appointed consul in the year 161 to actually prove that they were the new emperors and they were co emperors. Now, we see that happening when Nerva adopted Trajan. You see that the, the pair of them became consuls in 97 98 AD. So that was the way to show to the people that these are the co-emperors and these are new emperors. Now, on the, on on the onset of Marcus's reign, tragedy stroked the empire. Uh, it, it, it happened, it all happened in Armenia. You see, Armenia, as well as Assyria and Mesopotamia, and the smaller buffer states, they were buffer states between, between Parthia. Parthia was the only empire that was capable of hurting Rome. Apart from a few German or Scythian or Dacian tribes. Uh, you see these, these barbaric tribes, they were not organized enough. They had the manpower, but they were not organized like the Parthians. So Parthia was the, was the real threat. And Armenia was a battleground uh, between Rome for centuries. Before that, and for centuries after the reign of Marcus Aurelius. So, um, what happened was that the Parthians invaded Armenia and the Romans decided to strike back. The commander, uh, the, the, the Parthians were, were ruled by a capable shah who was called Volacusus IV. Several coins of the shah are preserved. Now, uh, Sirianus was the commander in Armenia at the time. And uh, the Greek mystic, uh, wise man or mysticist or priest uh, with the name of Alexander of Avondikos, uh, he uh, prophesied that Severianus would defeat the Parthians. And Severianus took his word for real and he invaded Armenia. And what happened was a disaster. The Roman troops were uh, surrounded and massacred. And not long after that, the Parthians also defeated Atelius Cornelianus. Now, uh, 
we don't really know what happened uh, in Armenia, but what is probable is that the, uh, the Parthians, they used the hit and run tactic. The one they used uh, when they defeated um, Crassus at Haran in 53 BC. So they used the, the horse archers. Now the Parthians and the Scythian allies, they were quick. They, they struck with the arrow and then they fell back. They struck with the arrow and then they held back. The heavy arm Romans could not catch up with them. They were excellent horsemen also. And they used Saracens as well. So that's probably why they defeated the Romans twice. And remember, this is just when Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus are appointed emperors. So imagine becoming an emperor, and a few months after that, you suffered two disasters. Now, in the following year, 162 AD, the Britons revolted. They were, de they were defeated by Julius Agricola, and Julius Agricola is probably related to the, the elder Julius Agricola, the writer and the son-in-law of Tacitus who was betrayed and executed by Domitian. Now, in the same year, the German, Hatti, they raided parts of uh, Rome and Germania and Raetia, but they were defeated by Aethelius Victorianus. Now, in the following year, 163, the Romans counterattacked. They invaded Armenia once more, and this time they sent Statius Priscus, a capable commander. The Romans captured Ataxata, by assault, the capital of Armenia, and soon after that, with hardly any resistance, Armenia fell to Rome once more. The Parthians quickly evacuated the, the province. Now, in the following year, 164, the Romans invaded Assyria and Mesopotamia proper, just like Trajan did a few years earlier. The Romans, under Avidius Cassius, now we see Avidius Cassius again, this Greek guy, this Greek aristocrat. They defeated the Parthians near the Euphrates River with the use of caterpillars, ornagers and scorpions and other missiles. See, it was long range. So they hit the Parthians back with their own tactics. Now in the following year, 165, the Romans finally captured all of Mesopotamia and Assyria. Avidius Cassius defeated the Parthians in a pitched battle somewhere in the province. The Romans captured and burnt Seleucia. Seleucia, at the Tigris River, was a Greek colony. And what happened was that Avidius Cassius, he entered, the, he entered the city as an ally. You see, he was a Greek himself. Most of the colonists were Greeks also. And he pretended to be their friend. But what happened was that he betrayed them. He treasuredly attacked them. And he killed many of them. And they even sacked the Temple of Apollo which was uh, considered to be a uh, blasphemy, a sacrilege. Soon after that, the Romans captured Ctesiphon. Statius Priscus captured Dura Evropos, a city with a large Jewish com community. The Romans also captured Babylon, and they seized many treasures. Now, because of the sad, the, the ancients believed that because the Romans captured they looted the temples and they captured gold. They were punished by a plague, and truly a plague, uh, a serious plague broke out in 165. So even though the Parthians were humiliated and driven out of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Armenia proper, and the smaller kingdoms of Vassoini or Duini, the Romans got a plague instead of a victory. And we also see that Lucius Verus, the co-emperor, he actually did nothing uh, uh, about the, the Parthians and the Armenians and their other allies. He spent most of his time partying, hunting, drinking, reading poetry at Antioch. He stayed back at Antioch. And it was Marcus Aurelius in Rome who directed affairs with his captains. Priscus, Aurelius Cassius and the other pick commanders. And the people learned to despise Lucius Verus. The people soon realized that it was Marcus Aurelius who was the true leader. Now, in the following year, the Romans were faced by large Germanic and Scythian tribes and Dacian tribes. There was a large coalition. 
Now the longer bar.